Arachnophobia is a 1990 horror film from director Frank Marshall. Frank began working with Steven Spielberg producing Raiders of the Lost Ark, and in 1980 the two men along with Frank's future wife Kathleen Kennedy founded Amblin Entertainment, the production company responsible for films like Gremlins, Back to the Future, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Frank never really saw himself as a director. He was happy working second unit for Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis until in late 1989 when Frank was approached by Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was chairman of Walt Disney Studios at the time, with an opportunity to direct his first feature film about a small Californian town that becomes overrun with spiders. While Frank did like the overall concept, he felt it was a little too straightforward for a horror movie, so he set to add a little more humor to it to help balance things out. The initial script was written by Dan Jacoby, who claimed to have been inspired by Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the 1954 giant ant film, Them. Frank hired on writer Wesley Strick to come on and help streamline the script a bit more. He wanted the film to be less straight horror and feel like something more akin to Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds or Steven Spielberg's Jaws, except with spiders. Frank liked what Wesley brought to the script, but the most important part of any successful horror film are the characters. You can have scary spiders that go around terrorizing everyone, but unless you have likable characters that the audience can get behind, then the horror never truly works. Casting was a bit of a challenge at first because many actors were turned off by the idea of having to work alongside many spiders. Luckily though, when Jeffrey Daniels came in, he had no issues, although he did tell Frank that he was already scared of spiders, so there really wouldn't be much acting. Although the smaller spiders didn't really cause him any concern, he thought you'd have to be crazy to at least not be a little intimidated by Big Bob, the main spider of the movie. I mean, I have a pr no problem with little daddy long legs, little, you know, guys like this, you know, but when you got things like this, you know, like this, I think anybody in his right mind would have a problem with that. Jeff was also a little critical of the early drafts of the script because he felt it was a little too by the numbers. But when the rewrites came in, he loved the shift in tone and the addition that his character now had a fear of spiders, something that was missing in earlier drafts. While the film was intended to be scary, there was also a lot of room for comedy to help ease the audience after a tense sequence. This led to the casting of John Goodman as the dopey but scene-stealing exterminator Delbert. Frank had met John Goodman while producing the Spielberg-directed film Always and knew he would be a perfect fit. Although he didn't really have much of a choice, Steven Spielberg told Frank that if he wanted him to produce the film, then he had to hire on John, something that he was planning on doing anyways. During this time, John was filming the hit show Roseanne, but had one week off a month, so all of John's scenes had to be split up, with half being filmed one month and the other half being filmed the next. John Goodman based his character off an exterminator he knew and a science teacher he had growing up, and Frank Marshall loved it. I don't have any problem. No, no we, we see each other eye to eye. We understand, well, two eyes to their 16. Actress Harley Kozak was brought on as Daniel's wife, and like her two male co-stars, she too had no issues working with the eight-legged arachnids. Was, can you work with spiders, do you think? I said, yeah, I think so. I, you know... I haven't spent a lot of time with spiders. Arachnophobia also boasts a fantastic supporting cast full of quirky character actors. Stuart Pankin as the bully Sheriff Parsons, Peter Jason as Coach Henry Beechwood, Roy Brock Smith as the mortician Irv Kendall, and a whole host of other brilliant actors that helped bring the small quaint town of Kanaima, California to life. Frank Marshall let each actor bring something special to their roles, which Peter Jason took full advantage of, teetering just on the edge of being too silly as the coach. During filming, the spiders really became a non-issue. Frank Marshall had experience working with live snakes and rats while filming the Indiana Jones film, so spiders were nothing. According to Marshall, there was an urban legend going around the Warner Brothers lot for years after the film had finished. Venomous spiders could still be found around the stage, which simply wasn't true, especially since the spiders weren't poisonous to begin with. The main spider, Big Bob, was found at Reptile Rentals in Los Angeles, a place known for having unusual and rare animals. Even though Big Bob was already pretty menacing, they painted on some purple markings on his back and even bulked him up a bit with a fake abdomen to give him a bigger appearance. There was no love lost between Jeff Daniels and Big Bob. Bob would often rear up and hiss at Daniels, but Daniels was always assured that the Wranglers would step in before anything could happen. If the spider gets too close, I'll jump in and I'll grab him. I'm going, 
but he's safe, right? Because he's absolutely safe as he waves his leather gloves in front of my face. For Big Bob's offspring, Marshall held what he called the Spider Olympics in order to find the right species for the film. They took various species and put them through various tasks like climbing glass, how scary they looked on camera, how fast they were, and various other tests. The Delina spider from New Zealand would ultimately come out on top and be used for the bulk of the film shooting. Along with the use of real spiders, a large fake animatronic spider was created to stand alongside the main spider Big Bob. Chris Wallace, the man responsible for creature effects on Gremlins, a film Frank Marshall had been executive producer on, came aboard to provide the animatronic effects. Amongst his team was future Mythbuster Jamie Heineman in one of his first gigs working on a Hollywood movie. Many of the larger sequences in the film were storyboarded, however because they were at the mercy of the spiders, how the spiders would react would often drive how the shots would be set up. The Wranglers did what they could, but the spiders had a mind of their own. They were sort of herded and coerced using various methods like blowing hot air, lemon pledge furniture wax which the spiders wouldn't walk on, or vibrating wires which the spiders would not cross. Regardless, many shots were still dictated based on how the spiders would react. After each take, every spider would be caught by spider wranglers, or even the actors so they could set up for the next shot, or a retake if necessary. Protecting the spiders was of utmost concern. At no time were the spiders ever harmed, and any time a spider is stepped on or crushed, like when John Goodman's character drops a boot down on one, they made sure to hollow out his boot so the spider would have somewhere safe to hide. The actors were trained on how to properly handle the spiders without harming them, and a few of the actors actually adopted some after the movie finished filming. Any dead spiders in the film were spiders that had died of natural causes. The same can be said for any other insects in the film. Any dead animals found throughout the movie, however, were all fake. The film follows Dr. Ross Jennings and his family as they move to small town Kanaima, California, only to find out it's been overrun by a new deadly species of spider. British entomologist James Atherton, played by the late great Julian Sands, discovers a new species of spider in a Venezuelan tepui. Frank Marshall liked shooting in real locations because it added more to the authenticity of the story he was trying to tell. Frank had heard about Tepui, large tabletop mountains that were completely isolated from the forest below and because of the changing climate and isolation, would often have rare species of animals and insects. This greatly inspired the opening scene where Sand's character finds the deadly spider. After the spider kills a nature photographer, the body is sent back to his home, but unbeknownst to all involved, the largest male spider climbs into the makeshift coffin. The coffin arrives in Kanaima, California, where mortician Irv Kendall notices the desiccated remains of the corpse, unaware it was drained of all of its fluids by the hitchhiking spider. The spider leaves the mortuary and is picked up by a crow which drops dead at the Jennings residence just as they arrive at their new home. Ross Jennings moved his family back to his old hometown so he can take over for the retiring doctor Sam Metcalf, only to find out after the fact that he doesn't want to retire. I'm not ready to retire, doctor. And if my wife can't rush me into it, you sure as hell can't either. So now Ross, without any patience, is in deep financial trouble. He does pick up his first patient, a neighbor named Margaret Hollins. She's grown tired of Dr. Metcalf's outdated practices and needs a doctor whose medical knowledge extends past the 1930s. While all this is going on, the large spider has found a mate in Ross's barn, which is going to lead to some not so fun moments for Ross as he has an intense fear of spiders. After a checkup with Mrs. Hollins, Ross takes her off her blood pressure meds, claiming she has no need for them, and as a thank you, she sets up a big party so everyone can get to know the new doctor and maybe he can get a few more patients. Meanwhile, Ross's wife Molly, known for her photography, takes a photo of the large spider web in their barn, unaware of the danger it presents. Molly brings Ross to check out the web and conquer his fear, but instead he comes face to face with the dried out husk of a rat. However, he misses the real star of the show, that being the pulsating spider egg sack hidden behind a wooden post. At Mrs. Holland's party, he meets a whole host of interesting characters, but doesn't seem to get any more patience. But as the party is winding down, one of the newly hatched spiders makes its way inside her home. That night as she prepares to go to bed, the spider drops down and bites her hand. Ross's new home has something of a wood rot problem. While trying to set up his wine rack, his nail gun goes straight through the boards and straight through the kitchen floor. So while his wife contacts an exterminator for what might be termites, Ross is going to check on Mrs. Hollins as her line has been busy all morning. Mrs. Hollins is found dead and Dr. Metcalf and the sheriff think she had a heart attack because Ross took her off her medication. 
Ross wants an autopsy performed because he thinks something else caused her death, but the others just won't allow it. At her burial, Coach Beachwood offers Ross some work if he stops by the gym later in the week. The next day, the exterminator arrives at the Jennings, and John Goodman basically steals every scene he is in. The majority of the film tries to be realistic and scary at times, but when Delbert arrives, he's accompanied by a score that just lets the audience know things are about to get silly. He finds no signs of any kind of termite in the cellar, the wood is simply just rotting. Ross is with the coach and after examining his team, he sits in the bleachers when one of the spiders climbs inside one of the player's helmets. The player is bitten right as he takes a big hit during practice and dies, but now Dr. Metcalf and some of the townsfolk are thinking Ross is responsible, even going as far as calling him Dr. Death. That night a spider climbs into one of the slippers of Dr. Metcalf and bites his toe. His wife calls Ross, but by the time he arrives, Metcalf is already dead. Ross orders an autopsy on Dr. Metcalf, and since he's now the town doctor, there's no one to tell him no. The results come back and it looks to be some kind of poisoning, but to be sure, Ross needs the previous victims to be autopsied as well. That night, the two larger spiders enter Ross's wine cellar with a very large egg sac. Ross contacts Dr. Atherton about his spider problem, but because he's too busy, he sends his assistant Chris Collins. They check over the exhumed bodies and find spider bites on each victim. However, since this is way out of Chris's league, he calls Atherton and tells him he needs to come down here ASAP. The following day, Ross, the sheriff, Chris, and medical examiner Milton check Metcalf's home for any more of the spiders. The sheriff finds one dead in a box of cereal he was just shoveling in his mouth, and Ross and Chris find one in the dining room that they catch with some crystal glassware. Meanwhile, at Coach Beachwood's home, his daughter takes a shower, and in a scene that pays homage to the shower scene in Psycho, it jumps on her face and slides down her body. The spider was only supposed to jump on her neck, but when the blow dryer is turned on, the spider landed on her face. Being the professional she is, actress Corey Wellens just went with it and thought it was perfect for the shot. Exterminator Delbert is called to the coach's house, but he doesn't find any spiders, all until he goes outside. His poison doesn't seem to have any effect, but nothing a good boot can't solve. Dr. Atherton arrives and meets with Ross and the others to explain what he believes is happening. These spiders he found, they work like ants. The large male mated with a small domestic female, spreading out these drones or soldier spiders. The smaller drones cannot reproduce and they have a short lifespan. However, based on Atherton's research, the next generation will be able to reproduce and will spread out from town to town, killing everything they come into contact with. So the only way to stop these spiders is to go to the mortuary where the body first arrived from Venezuela and kill the male there. However, with Irv's line busy, they decide to head over to his house so they can get this settled once and for all. Except when they arrive, they find Irv and his wife are already dead. Meanwhile, Atherton finds a photo Molly took of the web in the barn and asks the sheriff to take him there. The sheriff is sent to fetch Atherton's assistant and the exterminator, but he never makes it there. In a scene that was shot but never shown, the sheriff gets bit by a spider in his car and dies in a crash. However, since the scene was never added, the sheriff simply vanishes from the film. Remembering what Atherton said about the spiders spreading out, the men mark on a map where each death has taken place, and this is when the horrifying truth hits Ross. The spiders aren't coming from the mortuary, they're coming from his home. The men arrive at the home and Delbert finds the body of Dr. Atherton in the barn. Ross and Chris go inside the house to get his family, and the spiders just start pouring in from every crevice. The spiders block off the front door and are chasing the family like an aggressive swarm of hornets. The family leave out the bathroom window on the second floor, but Ross gets cut off by the spiders. As the family outside is nearly attacked by the spiders, Delbert arrives dual wielding some poison sprayers and what is the only bit of digital effects in the film. They couldn't cover the house in real spiders, so for this one scene, they used computer effects to make it seem like the house was overrun. Ross, now overcome with spiders, falls over a railing and straight through the floor into his cellar, where the nest and male and female spiders are hiding. This finale was the very last thing shot for the film. They waited until the very end because it was going to be the most effects heavy portion of the shoot. The shoot took two weeks, each day consisting of 13 hours, and poor Jeff Daniels spent the majority of it under a wine rack while a very large spider crept towards him. The female is taken care of fairly swiftly when it's thrown into a fuse box. However, the much larger male intervenes when Ross attempts to light the egg sac on fire with a bottle of alcohol. Ross gets stuck under a wine rack and starts throwing bottles at the spider. 
Jeff Daniels was actually throwing bottles at a real spider, Big Bob, but he was told not to hit him. In fact, he missed every single time by at least three feet, if not more. Eventually, he flings the male into some burning paint cans just as the egg sac begins to hatch. The male comes flying out completely engulfed in flames, and Ross, with his trusty nail gun, shoots the spider right into the hatching egg sac. Delbert pulls Ross out of the cellar, and the rest of the spiders are all dead or dying. The film opened July 20th, 1990, and was the first film to be released under the Hollywood Pictures umbrella, which was an extension of Disney where they could release more mature-themed films that weren't exactly aimed towards families. Disney executives nearly had the film title changed to Along Came a Spider because they felt the title Arachnophobia sounded a little too intense. Luckily, cooler heads prevailed and the original title was kept. Because the advertisers were unsure how to market the film, either a thriller or a comedy, the film was advertised as a thrillomedy because the word horror is almost a no-no in Hollywood. Horror comedies have existed long before arachnophobia came out, but thriller seems to be a more acceptable term when it comes to mainstream Hollywood. The film did well both commercially and with critics. Budgeted around $22 million, it made $53.2 million, plus another $30 million in video rental and sales. A source of revenue Hollywood seems to forego these days for the less financially stable streaming. Critics were favorable to the film and even Siskel and Ebert, known for being kind of snobby when it comes to horror, both gave the movie a thumbs up. Arachnophobia has gone on to have something of a cult following. In 1991, a video game adaptation was released for PC and DOS. The film also received a novelization and a comic book from Hollywood Comics. Proving like always that Hollywood has no original ideas, a remake of Arachnophobia was also announced on June 2nd of 2022, with James Wan, the man known for fantastic films like The Nun 2 and Aquaman 2, set to produce alongside Frank Marshall. Arachnophobia is a fun little horror film. There's nothing offensive, it's not gory, there's really no bad language, but it hits that nice balance of being creepy while at the same time just being fun. If you're looking for something a little scary that the whole family can enjoy, then you really can't go wrong with this little cult classic. Yeah, that's right. I'm bad. <laughs>